Genesis chapter 12. And look at verse number 7, Genesis chapter 12, verse 7. The Bible says, And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. The title for the sermon this morning is The Seed of Abraham. The Seed of Abraham. So let's pick it up in verse number 1, Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. There's a lot here. There's going to be a lot that we can get out of Abraham's life. And it says here in verse number 1, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Okay? Now the first thing I want to cover this morning is just what we read there in verse number 3. Right at the end there. And in thee... Now, thee is singular, speaking to Abraham, and in Abraham shall all families of the earth be blessed. Okay? And if we can just backtrack there in verse number 2 as well. And I will make of thee a great nation, I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless him that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. Now, immediately, just straight off the gate, I've just got to, uh, you know, dismantle some false teaching that's out there. And I don't know what it is, it's just, a, it's just the nature of the sermons that I'm preaching. Again, we're talking about Judaism, we're talking about Israel, okay? And, you know, there are, there are Christians, believers who I love, Baptist brethren that I care about, that have been my pastors, my brethren, that will say, hey, you've got to bless 1948 Israel, okay? That's what's being promised here. If you're a blessing to 1948 Israel, then the Lord will bless you. And if you curse them, then God will curse you, you know? And, and they, they look at, you know, even the United States, they look at the, the prosperity, the wealth, the blessings that the United States has and say, well, the reason why they're so blessed is because they've been a blessing to Israel. But I say to you that prior to 1948, the United States was blessed. Prior to that, they were prosperous. I mean, since 1948, that place has become a hellhole. Since 1948, I mean, when they started blessing Israel is when they started to be cursed. And it's, it's when they started to become full of iniquity and affecting the nations around all the world and, and you know, influencing the nations around the world. The reason Australia is going down, you know, a, a dark path, the reason why Australia, our nation, is becoming such a wicked nation is, honestly, they're just following the footsteps of the United States. So I don't know what kind of blessing that is. I mean, that's a curse. That's a curse. Now, look, obviously, that's not what's being referred to here. When the Bible says, in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed, the good thing about the Bible is we don't need to go off some prophecy expert. We don't need to go off, you know, dispensational teaching. The great thing about the Bible is quite often, I mean, more often than not, the New Testament tells us about the Old Testament. The New Testament, you know, is a commentary to the Old Testament. So what we want to understand here in verse number three, how is it that all families of the earth will be blessed through Abraham? Okay, how is that? Well, leave, keep your finger there and go to Acts chapter three. Acts chapter 3, verse 24. Acts chapter, 20, uh, Acts chapter 3, sorry. Acts chapter 3, verse 24. And I love it when we just have commentary, because then we don't have to wonder. You know, we, it's straight there. The Bible tells us. Acts chapter 3, verse 24. The Bible says, Yea, <clears throat> and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. So we see all the prophets, including Samuel and all those after Samuel, have foretold, have prophesied of these days, the days of Acts, right? After the resurrection of Christ, the fact that, you know, the disciples were going out preaching the gospel. And it says here in verse number 25, Ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, And in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Okay, we saw that, right? All the kindreds of the earth be blessed. He said that to Abraham, and of course that plays into his seed. Say, so who is the seed of Abraham? You know, we've got a passage, we've got it here in verse number 26. Unto you first God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you. Hey, who's the seed? Jesus. Jesus. How, do we, how, is all, how are all the nations of the earth blessed? By Abraham and his seed? Because Jesus came to bless you. Jesus has come to bless all the nations of the earth. It says here, in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. That's how all the nations of the earth are blessed today. That's how they were all blessed from the time of Acts till forever. It's because every nation, everybody has the ability to place their faith in Christ. 
Christ wants to bless each one of us. And how does he bless us? By turning away us from our iniquities. Taking our iniquities on the cross. That's how he took them away. And if you place your faith on Christ, you're blessed. Okay? You're blessed. And that's the promise that God gave Abraham all the way there in Genesis chapter 12. Man, I want to be... I, I, in fact, if you are saved, you're blessed already. You're blessed because your iniquities have been removed, have been taken away from you. Okay? They were put on Christ and he paid for it all. So, you know, please, let's understand the Bible. I hope you, you realize and appreciate how important it is, you know, for us to go to the New Testament. That's quite often, that's why I often say, if you haven't read your Bible through once, start with the New Testament. Start with the New Testament, and then you'll understand the Old Testament better when you go through that, okay? Because we have the commentary there, and it's, it's just a, it's a great thing that we see, okay? Now, let's go back to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12, verse number 4. Genesis chapter 12, verse 4. It says, So Abram departed. As the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him, and Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. Okay? Now, the question is, where did Abraham or Abram depart from? My question to you is, let's look at it again. Where did he depart from? It said he departed out of Haran. Did you see that? Out of Haran. Say, so why were they in Haran? Well, let's just quickly go back to Genesis 11. I didn't really cover the, the last verses of Genesis 11 because I wanted to save it for this chapter. But Genesis 11, verse number 31, I want you to, to notice this in verse 31, Genesis 11, 31. It says, And Terah took Abram his son, and Lot the son of Haran, his, sorry, and Lot the son of Haran, his son's son, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went forth with them from, I want you to, this is important, from where? from Ur of the Chaldees, to go into the land of Canaan, and they came unto Haran and dwelt there. And the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Okay, so understand what's happening here. Where did they originally start from, this family? They started from, it said there, um, from Ur of the Chaldees, right? Ur of the Chaldees. That's where they originally started from. Then, they were to go, it said there in verse number 31, to go into the land of Canaan. They left Ur of the Chaldees to go to the land of Canaan, okay? But they didn't make it to the land of Canaan. They got, they got up to Haran and they dwelt there. Now, we don't know all the information, all the reasons why that took place. I mean, I could come up with many reasons, but the Bible doesn't really spell it out for us, okay? But that's where they came into unto Haran, okay? Now, when we get to chapter 12... Um, Abraham's father passes away there in Haran and then uh, Abraham picks everyone up, picks all, all things up to go to the land of Canaan, okay? To go to the land of Canaan. So I want you to understand there was this, this, this stop before they went to the land of Canaan. Now you say, why is that imp important? Because let's go to Acts chapter 7 now. Why is that important? Go to Acts chapter 7 verse 2. Acts chapter 7 verse 2. And while you're turning there, just, um, I, sh I should have asked you just to notice Genesis 12, verse 1. So if you've still got your finger there, you might want to go there while you go to Acts 7. But Genesis 12, 1, it said, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country. The Bible doesn't say here, Now the Lord said unto Abram. Okay? It, the Lord didn't say these words to Abram when he was in Haran. The Bible says, Now the Lord had said, past tense. Okay, and what I want to show you is these words that, that we read here in Genesis 12, they're not words that were said at Haran and that's why they left. No, these were words that were said to Abram in the Ur of the Chaldees prior to going to Haran. Okay, prior to that, and, and we'll prove this here in Acts chapter 7, Acts chapter 7, verse 2. And these are the words of Stephen, um, who was obviously martyred for his faith, but Acts chapter 7, verse 2. He says, and he said, men, brethren, and fathers, hearken, listen. The God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Charan. Now, Charan just dropped the sea. Okay, it's Haran. Okay, that's the, 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 the stop, the pit stop that they had uh, when they were on the way to Canaan. Okay, so the, the, uh, God had already appeared to Abraham before they went to Charan. Or Haran. Okay, there. And verse number three, how did it appear? What did he say to him? Verse number three, and said unto him, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and come into the land which I will show thee. Then came he out of the land of the Chaldeans. We saw that, the Ur of the Chaldees. 
and dwelt in Charan, and from thence, when his father was dead, he removed him into this land wherein ye now dwell. So do you see the, the chronology there? Okay? When he was in the, um, the land of the, uh, what did it say there in verse number four? Land of the Chaldeans. That's when the Lord called Abraham. That's when he called him and said, hey, leave that land and go to the land of Canaan. All right? That's when he called him. But then he had that stop there in Charan or Haran. And it's when his father Terah died that he eventually decided, well, now, now it's time for us to leave. He left and went to the land of Canaan. Okay? Say, so why, why are you telling us that? Well, just to know the Bible better, number one. But number two, I just want to show you that this, was, um, this chapter has two mistakes that Abraham made. Okay, two mistakes. The Lord had called him to the land of Canaan. And he also told him, if you go back to Genesis 12, Genesis 12, verse number, verse number one again, when he calls him out of the land of uh, the Chaldeans, he says, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, and look at this, and from thy father's house. Now, that, when it says house, it's not talking about the building. It's talking about your father and his family. He's, he told Abraham, leave your family, leave your father, leave that family, and go to the land that I've called you. Okay? And so we see the first mistake. Now, look, Abraham is a great man of faith. And I believe that he was already saved at this point in time, and I'll prove that to you later on in the sermon. But one thing I want you to notice, even though we, we elevate Abraham up, he was still a man. He was still a man that had weaknesses. He was still a man that had some doubts. And he did not obey the Lord perfectly. Because the Lord told him, leave your family. Leave your father. Okay? And what happens? I'm just going to tell you what I think may have happened. Abram's like, because he believed the Lord. We know he believed the Lord. He, we, we know that he said, yes, the Lord's calling me. That's the land that we're going to inherit. I'm going to, I believe that. And when he's going to tell, tell his dad, hey dad, I'm leaving. I'm going to the land of Canaan. His dad would have been, yep son, I'm coming along with you. You know, let, let me help you. You know, let me be the one that guides and leads you. And we see this was the mistake that was made, okay? That he allowed his father to tag along with him. Why? Because then they ended up in Haran instead of going to the land of Canaan. That's not where the Lord called him. The Lord did not call him to Haran. He had called him to the land of Canaan and they ended up dwelling in Haran. Why? Because he took the leadership of his father rather than following in obedience to what, Jesus, uh, what the Lord had called him to do. Okay? Now, this is a lesson for us. This is a lesson for us, is that when the Lord calls you to do something, say, how do I know the Lord's calling me to do something? Because the Bible says so. Okay? As soon as you see what the Bible says, you say, this is something that I need to do, and you might even express that to your family. You know, you may experience where your family says, you know, because they're a bit concerned about you, right? Says, yeah, you know, I'll help you along. I'll help you along. But what they mean by that is, oh, let me control you. Let me, let me make sure you don't go too far. Uh, you said, Canaan, I'll come along with you, but we'll, we'll just stop at Haran and we'll just live there. That's where we're going to live, right? I mean, it, it, you know, and, and of course, I'm sure there was, a lo- there was definitely a love between father and son there. But, you know, even, even when family are, are well-meaning, even when they're trying to be a help, they can be a hindrance to you from obeying the Lord God. And you see that Abraham had to wait for his father to die before he went into obedience, obedience and went to the land of Canaan as the Lord had called him. Hey, this is Abraham's first mistake that we see in the Bible, okay? And he's, he's, a, he's a normal man. These, these things are in the Bible here so we can learn from that, okay? Listen, when, the call, when, when God asks you to do something, you just do it, okay? You don't need to go and get approval from anybody else. If the Lord says that's what you need to do, that's what you do, okay? I mean, if, if you seek, you, you could get into trouble because there's other people that do love you. They mean well for you, they, but they can prevent you from following the Lord perfectly, okay? So, go back to Genesis 12, please. Genesis chapter 12. And uh, verse number 5, verse number 5. The Bible says, And Abram took Sarai his wife, and Lot his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. Okay? So now we have, after that stop at Haran, now they're heading finally to the land of Canaan. We don't know exactly how long they stayed in Haran. Okay, we don't know exactly how long. But he says here that he takes his wife, he takes Lot, his nephew, and they also take the souls that they had got in Haran. So at this point now, um, Abraham had many servants. You know, I guess they were wealthy, they had servants, and everybody that was part of that family, part of that group, went together to the land of Canaan. And of course, in chapter 14, we won't go there now, but in chapter 14, we see that Abraham has a small army. 
You know, he's able to go and fight, make, make warfare. And the reason for that is because he had many servants that were trained and skilled to be soldiers. Verse number six. And Abram passed through the land unto the place of Sikkim, unto the plain of Mori, and the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there built it he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. Okay. Now we already had confirmation from Acts chapter 3 who that seed was. For the blessing that would, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. That's Jesus Christ. But I do want you to now turn to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. Because yes, Christ is the seed but there's also an extension to that seed. And we'll have a look at this in Galatians chapter 3, verse 7. Galatians chapter 3, verse 7. Because again, you're going to get those that say, well, the seed here is 1948 Israel, right? You're going to get that. It's 1948. Now look, maybe some of them are part of that seed, and we'll look at that soon, okay? But uh, this is very clear in the Scriptures, and for some reason, I, I know the reason, but our Baptist brethren don't like Galatians 3, okay? I don't think I've ever heard any preaching on Galatians 3. And I've been going to Baptist churches pretty much my whole life, okay? And the reason they don't like it is because they hold to dispensationalism. And Galatians 3 just demolishes dispensationalism. <laughs> totally demolishes it, right? And so they struggle with trying to make Galatians fit. Like, they're not trying to... Look, it's one, I, I, would, I have respect for the pastors that do believe in dispensationalism, but then when they read something like Galatians 3, they then say, well, I need to change my understanding of dispensationalism because it needs to fit the Bible. I have respect for that. But what happens is they say, well, Galatians 3 says that. I've got to change what Galatians 3 says to make it fit dispensationalism. Okay? But let's look at Galatians 3, verse 7. Galatians 3, verse 7. The Bible says, Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. I already preached, when did I preach to you guys? Was it on Wednesday about being the Israel of God? About you, you being a Jew inwardly? Was that Wednesday? I can't remember. Anyway, I, I preached that recently. But once again here, the Bible tells us that we who are of faith, hey, do you, do you, are you saved by grace through faith? Hey, if that's you, the Bible says that the same, the same, the same people are the children of Abraham. That means you're a child of Abraham. Accept it, you know? And yes, the Old Testament Jews... If they were saved, if they were of faith, they were also children of Abraham. You see, you can be a child of Abraham in the flesh, hey, but that's not going to profit you anything. Or you can be a child of Abraham in faith, okay? And that will make you a, a receiver of his promises, as I was, was keep seeing here. Verse number 8, And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. Okay, so then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Why are we blessed? Because we've been saved, right? We're of faith. But also notice that it said here in verse number eight that he uh, that God preached before the gospel unto Abraham. How did he preach the gospel to him? Saying, "In thee shall all nations be blessed." And this is why I believe Abraham was saved in the land of um, of the Ur of the Chaldees. Before he even departed anywhere. You know, before he was misguided by his father. Because that we already saw that God said these words to Abraham prior to him leaving. And it says here that God preached the gospel unto Abraham. Amen. Listen, there's only one gospel. Okay, there's one, one gospel. I mean, we, we get the idea here, in thee all nations shall be blessed. We get the commentary of Acts chapter 3 saying, well, that's Christ. Okay, well, that means that God would have told Abraham about Christ. You know, he would have told him about the death, burial, and resurrection. He'd say, no, no, you're going too far. But that's why he was willing to sacrifice Isaac. We'll get to that later on in the chapters. Because he was expecting Isaac to be resurrected from the dead because he thought Isaac was a picture of Jesus Christ. Okay? So he definitely had the gospel, as we know it, preached unto Abraham. Okay? This is prior to him leaving anything. Okay? Because he received it by faith. Let's keep going. In, uh, let's drop, drop down to verse 14. Genesis, uh, Galatians 3.14. That the blessing of Abraham, that's to the Jews. The blessing of Abraham is to the Jews. What did it say here? That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles. What? The, that's not the Jews. Yeah, the Gentiles. Why? Because it's not about your physical descendancy. It's about your faith. If you have the same faith as Abraham, you're a child of Abraham. Okay? It says here, unto the Gentiles through 
Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be, uh, though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. Look, promises, plural. All the promises that we read there, to Ab- or we're going to keep reading, to Abraham in Genesis 12, all the promises, okay, now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made, he saith not unto seeds, with an S there, seeds, as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. Man, that's who the promises have been made to. To Abraham and his seed, which is Christ. So what? Well, I, th- I thought it was Israel. Well, yes, if they're in Christ. If they're in Christ, they are also receivers of the promises, but so are the Gentiles if they're in Christ. If we're of faith, we're the ones that receive the promises that were given to Abraham. I mean, this is something to rejoice over. This is something that should, we should be, you know, this is amazing. This is amazing promises all the way to Abraham. And we know he was a great man. Hey, those same promises were made to us, the Gentiles, because we're of faith, you know. And I don't know why you want to change this in Galatians 3. Just do away with dispensationalism and believe what God says in his word. Let's go down to uh, verse 28, please. Galatians 3, 28. I mean, the whole chapter is awesome, but let's just drop down. There is neither Jew nor... Now, I'm not saying to you I'm better than the Jews, okay? Because if the Jews are of faith, as are the Gentiles, the Bible is very clear, there is neither Jew nor Greek. It doesn't matter. You know, your physical... DNA, descendancy, doesn't matter. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. See, it's Jesus that levels it out. Regardless of how powerful, how rich, what kind of position you have, what kind of DNA you have, we're all one in Christ Jesus. And then verse 29, And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Heirs, that means we receive the inheritance of the promises that were said to Abraham. We're heirs of that as well. Praise God for his truth. Praise God for his promises. Okay, please don't allow these pastors to, you know, uh, mis- mis- misguide you. Okay, and say, well, it's not for you, your plan B. You know, you need to go and give, you know, the Jews, you know, all the blessings because it's not yours. Okay, no, no, it's, it's, it's crystal clear. Uh, you know, I, it's crystal clear. All right, so let's just go back to Genesis 12, please. Genesis 12, verse 8. Genesis 12, verse 8. I feel like saying more about that, but why should I when the scriptures are so clear, right? Genesis 12, verse 8. Let's keep going. Genesis 12, verse 8. And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and Hai on the east. And there he built an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. Now, I want to stop here because I already mentioned to you when I believe Abraham was saved, okay? But I want to show you some other positions. There's about four positions out there as to when Abraham got saved, okay? And what we just read here, we read about Abraham building an altar, and it says after he built the altar that he called upon the name of the Lord, okay? And some people will claim this is when Abraham was saved, all right? Because, of course, Romans 10, 13, and whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, Okay, and so they say, well, this is now the point where Abraham's calling on the name of the Lord. This is the point that he got saved. But my question to you is, do we only call upon the name of the Lord when we need to be saved? No. Every time we pray, every time we we seek the Lord, we're calling upon his name. Okay, yes, you do need to call upon his name to be saved. Yes. Okay, but the rest of your life, you ought to be calling upon the name of the Lord all the time. You should be in prayer every time and, and, and asking in Jesus' name, aren't we? We're meant to, Jesus instructs us when we pray, we ought to ask in His name. So we're always calling upon the name of the Lord. We're always asking the Lord to help and guide us. So that's not, you know, and you know, you'll find other references of the Bible where saved men are calling upon the name of the Lord. Okay, because they're just praying. You know, they're seeking the Lord's guidance, seeking the Lord's face. So that's, that's one position is that, well, this is when he got saved. My question is, if this is when he got saved, he's already building an altar. (laughs) You know, he's already building an altar. You're saying he's doing that as an unsaved man, building an altar, and then he calls upon the name of the Lord and he gets saved? No. The reason he's building an altar is because he's already saved. The reason he's building an altar is because God's already preached him the gospel. 
and is already familiar with the need for blood sacrifice. And of course, in the Old Testament days, they were still doing the altar and the animal sacrifices. So Abraham already knew that. He already knew the picture of that and what that was pointing to. And so you can see he was already a man of faith. That's why he built the altar. Okay? And then he was just calling upon the name of the Lord, uh, praying to him. So that position doesn't hold up. Now, go to Genesis 15, please. Genesis 15, verse 6. Genesis 15, verse 6. And the, the second position that's out there is that Abraham got saved in Genesis 15. You know, we're in Genesis 12. I believe this man's definitely saved by now. Uh, but some people will point to Genesis 15, verse 6. And I, I, even I've had some challenges with this passage. Because <clears throat> in Genesis 15, verse 6, it says, and, and he, speaking of Abraham, <clears throat> and he believed in the Lord, and he counts it to him for righteousness. Okay, so what does that sound like? Keep your finger there. Actually, you don't have to keep your finger there. You can, go back to, you can go back to Genesis 12. But go to Romans 4 now. Romans chapter 4, verse 2. Romans chapter 4, verse 2. And the reason some people think that he got saved in Genesis 15 is because many of us, you know, if we're stuck at the door with somebody that believes in a works-based gospel, you know, many of us, or, or they quote James 2, you know, faith without works is dead, will quite often then turn to Romans 4 and disprove that, okay? And so this is something we use a lot for our soul winning efforts, and rightly so, I'm not saying it's wrong, rightly so. But then we get to Romans 4, verse 2. The Bible says, For if Abraham were justified by works, he have whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the Scripture? Now, when he's saying this, he's pointing back to Genesis 15, what we just read. What saith the Scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. So they say, see, Abraham was not saved by works, correct? He was saved by faith, correct? And then they'll say, well, when was he saved by faith? Well, it says here, when the scripture said it, they're in Genesis 15, and so Genesis 15 is when he got saved. So you can, I can understand why people have that view. I'm not saying they're idiots or something like that. I understand it, because it is, it kind of seems that way, right? But here's, here's the thing, you know, uh, Romans 4.2 is not teaching, this is the point of time that Abraham was saved okay it's not teaching this is the point of time it's teaching this is the method by which he was saved okay the method which was his faith okay and of course we're instructed as believers to live by faith we're instructed to walk in faith we're instructed as believers to go from faith to faith okay so yes you get saved the moment you believe on, on the on the gospel you know that moment you place your faith on the gospel but the rest of your life is also a life where you're to walk by faith, okay? And every time you do things by faith, the Lord counts it as righteousness. It's righteous when God sees you doing things by faith. You know, the Lord doesn't wait for you to do the works before He sees the righteousness. The Lord sees the faith in your heart when God says something about the Bible, and you're like, Lord, I don't know, but I believe that. The Lord, well, He's going to count that for righteousness. The fact that, you know, you believe the Lord... Every time you believe what God says to you in the Bible, it's a righteous thing to do, okay? And, and so, by extension, because that is how God sees righteousness, by extension, of course, when you place your faith on Christ on the gospel, that's counted to you for righteousness as well. That's how you're saved, because that verse is basically, basically teaching us that it's not by the works, okay? It's not by the works that Abraham did, but rather his faith that he placed on the Lord. So that's the second position that's out there is that uh, Genesis 15 is when Abraham got saved. But I don't believe Ro that Romans 4 is telling us the time, but rather the method by which he was saved, okay? The third position out there that says when Abraham was saved, and I already covered this at the beginning, so we'll go through this very quickly. But just back in Genesis chapter 12, verse 4. Genesis chapter 12, verse 4. And I do need to cover this a little bit because it, 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 if, you do, if you believe this, again, I don't think you're wicked or anything, but it can lead to dangerous ground. Okay, and Genesis 12 verse 4 says, So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot with him. And Abram was 70 and five years old when he departed out of Haran. So that's how you see this is now when he finally, you know, he departed Haran, he finally left to go to Canaan. Now this is the point that he got saved. Okay, and um, we, we already saw that the Lord had called him prior to being in Haran. Okay. So, I mean, that already doesn't line up, okay? That already doesn't line up. And Abraham already made the effort to leave, but he was misguided by his father, okay? So that doesn't line up there. But the problem with this position is 
Well, we know he got saved because now he's actually on his way to Canaan. And what that can lead to is a workspace gospel. Okay, he got saved because he packed his bags and now he's walking. See, he's making the effort. You can see his faith. He's, he's, he's on his journey now. It's, it's by, it becomes by works. Okay, and so you can see the danger there. Instead of seeing his faith in believing the promise that God gave to Abraham as, as uh, his, you know, his, his salvation, now we're seeing his walk to Canaan as his salvation. That's, that's the danger of believing that position. Now, I'm not saying that everyone that believes that believes in a works gospel. I'm just saying it's dangerous. It can lead to that. And I have seen people use that as evidence for a works-based gospel. All right? So, um, you know, the reason why he wasn't saved there, I already proved it before, okay, that the Lord had called him prior. But there is another way we can prove this. Go to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, okay? Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8. And again, you know, as we go through Genesis, we're going to continually be going through Hebrews 11 as well, you know, side by side, because, you know, of course, Hebrews 11 is the great chapter of faith, the hall of faith, okay? Now, it's not saying, when we go through the hall of faith, it's not saying that these are the points these men got saved. It's just giving us the examples of their great faith and what it, co- it led them to achieve in their lives, okay? It's not saying this is the point that he got saved, you know? Noah got saved when he built the ark. That's when he got saved. No, no, no. You know, he already found grace in the eyes of the Lord prior to building the ark, okay? But of course, when we have our faith in the Lord, we can do great works, and that's what Hebrews 11 is about, is just showing us the great works these men did because of their faith, all right? Now, Hebrews 11, verse 8, Hebrews 11, verse 8, the Bible says, this is important, by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for inheritance, obeyed, and he went out, not knowing whither he went, okay? Now, look at this. When was he called? When was he called out to go into the place? When he was still in the Ur of the Chaldees. That's when he was called. And it says here, he did it by faith. You see, he was already a man of faith. He was already a believer when the Lord called him to leave the Ur of the Chaldees. So when we look at Genesis 12 verse 4, we say, well, he's finally left Haran. No, no, no. He was already a man of faith prior to that in the Ur of the Chaldees. And we can already, you know, we've already proven that before. But once again, it's proven here in Hebrews 11 verse 8. Otherwise, if he's not a saved man, if he's not a man of faith, why would you list that down in the hall of faith as a great work of faith that he did? Okay. So I don't know exactly at what point Abraham was saved, but it was definitely when he was in the Ur of the Chaldees. Prior to that, and then the Lord calls him to leave his family. All right. So let's just go back to, and then the final, the fourth position as to when he got saved is what I just told you. Okay, when he was already in the uh, in Mesopotamia, in the land of the Chal- 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 Chaldees. All right, now I want to move on a little bit here. Let's. Uh, you guys are still in Hebrews, right? Hebrews eleven. Look at verse nine. Hebrews eleven, verse nine. Now, Hebrews eleven, verse nine. The Bible says, "By faith he sojourned in the land of promise." What was the land of promise? The land of Canaan. Okay, the land of promise. He sojourned as in a strange country dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. Say, why? Why was he going around as a stranger? You know, in a strange country, going as a sojourner. 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 Yeah, you'd say that, right? Why? Verse number 10. For he looked for a city which have foundations, that's great, whose builder and maker is God. Say, why didn't Abraham just settle and start, you know, uh, you know just uh, start building a city? And, you know, Abraham did never receive the promise of the land in his time. He never, he never inherited it. Now, the, the promise was given to him and to his seed, okay? But he never inherited the land. In fact, when Sarai, his wife, passes away, he had to purchase a piece of land to bury his wife. He never inherited in his lifetime from the Lord. Why is that important? Because the land is just a picture, okay? The land is just a type of what's more important, okay? What's more important? What was Abraham looking forward to? He was looking for a city which had foundation, whose, whose maker, what did it say there? Whose maker was the Lord. Sorry, what's the reference that I was turn, telling you guys to turn to? Verse number 10, Hebrews 11, verse 10. For he looketh for a city which have foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Now, go back to Acts 7, please. Acts 7, verse 5. Acts 7, verse 5. Because it might sound unusual 
for me to say that he never inherited the physical land. Okay? But go to Acts chapter 7, verse 5. Acts chapter 7, verse 5. The Bible says, And he gave him none inheritance in it, no, not so much as to set his foot on, yet he promised that he would give it to him for a possession and to his seed after him, when as yet he had no child. Okay? So again, we have confirmation that uh, Abraham never in his lifetime inherited the land. Okay? He, was never, he, never had, he never had any of the possession. That's why I'm saying he had to buy a piece of land, right? But it was promised as an inheritance to him and his seed. Okay? So what's that about? The seed is Christ, and we're also of the children of Abraham if we're in his seed. What's that about? Well, I believe this is a twofold prophecy or twofold promise, you know? And number one is that when the Lord comes back to set up his millennial kingdom, we know he's going to be in Jerusalem, okay? And this is why I do believe in a new Israel, as a sense, okay? This is why I believe in the millennium there will be a new Israel by which Jesus Christ would rule from. But remember, we're going to rule and reign with him. So from a physical perspective, you know, yes, that will be our nation. That will be our land when we're in our new resurrected bodies, ruling and reigning with Christ. But again, just remember that thousand year period is just a temporary period. It's not forever and ever. Why? Because again, it's just a picture of the real city that we need to be looking for. Okay? The real city whose maker is God. The one that God is building for us. All right? Now go to Revelation chapter 21, please. Revelation 21 verse 1. Revelation chapter 21, verse 1. The Bible says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. This is the city that Abraham was looking forward to. Okay, when, when God promised him the land of Canaan, you know, for him and his seed in the inheritance, it's like, well, I know that's just a picture of the greatest city that I'm looking for, the, the, whose, whose maker is God, the one that's going to come out of heaven. And it says it was prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Drop down to verse number nine. Verse number nine. And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, and I will show thee the bride. The lamb's wife. I mean, that's clear. You know, the angel says to John, let me show you the bride, the lamb's wife, the wife of Jesus Christ. You say, well, that's the church. Well, sort of, okay, sort of. But look at verse number 10. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. So according to the Bible, what's the lamb's wife? What's the bride of, of, of Christ? It's New Jerusalem. It's a city. Okay, that's what it is. All right? Now, by extension, we too, because we're going to populate that city, okay, as people that are the seed of Abraham. And then uh, verse number uh, 12, please. Verse number 12, the Bible says, and you know, talking about the city, and had a great, uh, wall great and high and had 12 gates. And at the gates, 12 angels. And the names written thereon, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. So you see, even the Old Testament tribes of Israel, hey, they can participate in the city. You know, they were expected, yes, we're in the land of Canaan, but hey, we, we're looking forward to the, to the city of God. We're looking forward to those gates that are there, you know, and if they're part of those tribes, I assume that's how they enter into that city, as long as they were of faith, okay? As long as they were of faith, and then verse number uh, 14, please. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations. Remember, Abraham was looking for a city with foundations? Well, here it is. 12 foundations, right? And in them, and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Now, why is that important? Because the church, the New Testament church, was built upon the apostles of the Lamb. Okay, they're the ones that went out starting these churches. So hey, it's not just Old Testament Israel that that city is made for but also for the New Testament churches, okay? We're all going to be, all of us of faith are going to participate in that, uh, that uh, city. And so, yes, the church is the bride if you want, but because we're in the city. And so is Old Testament Israel. The Old Testament Israelites that were of faith, they too are part of the city. They too make up the bride of the Lamb, okay? And uh, verse number, or I'll just leave it there for now, but 
I've had people mock me for this belief, <laughs> like friends of mine, and I, my, I, 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 I don't mind being mocked, because I usually mock people as well. But, uh, <laughs> but I've had people mock me and saying, well, man, if you believe these promises were for you, Kevin, you know, why aren't you out in Israel right now? Why aren't you claiming a piece of land right now and saying, hey, this is my promise, this is my land, you know, you know, instead of, you know, because you're, you're a child of Abraham, right? And the promises have been given to you. Well, first of all, because I'm like Abraham, I don't care about the physical land. Like Abraham, I'm looking forward to the city of God. I'm looking for that land, number one. That's what's more important, okay? But number two, because Jesus told us, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Okay, so Jesus is not telling us, go to Israel and take a piece of land for yourself. Maybe in the millennium we can have a piece of land, I don't know. But hey, you know, right now we're called to go to the whole world, you know, and preach the gospel. So that would be counteractive uh, to that commandment. You know, that would be me disobeying the Lord God, trying to grab myself a piece of land, you know, when I, when I, I don't care about it, first of all. But second of all, it's not what Jesus wants me to do anyway with my life, okay? I'm in the land of Australia. This is the outermost part of the world as far as when Jesus Christ said those words. I'm right where he wants me to be, you know, as long as I'm out going out preaching the gospel. Go back to Genesis 12, please. Genesis, uh, Genesis chapter 12, verse 9. Genesis chapter 12, verse 9. There's a lot to unpackage here. We're only up to verse number 9, but you can see it's so important for us to understand it. And it's beautiful. The Bible's beautiful. You know, the Bible's beautiful because it just tells us. It's just clear. It's straightforward. We don't need to muck around with it. But verse number 9, And Abram journeyed going on still toward the south. And there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. And this is now the second mistake from Abraham, the second mistake that we read about him in the chapter. You see, sometimes in your life, the Lord's going to call you to do certain things. You know, you know the Bible says, I'm going to do that, but then the famine comes. Okay, the, the trials come, the difficulties come. It gets a little bit too difficult, you know, and then you're going to be tempted to find your own solution. Look, Jesus... Uh, the Lord asked Abraham to go to the land of Canaan. Okay, he told him to go there. And what we see is when the famine comes, Abraham says, well, I guess I've got to go to Egypt because that's where there's food and you know, the necessities of life and we need to pr provide for ourselves. Okay? But here's the thing. If the Lord tells you to do something, if the Lord tells you to go somewhere and there's famine, who's going to provide for you? It's going to be the Lord. If the Lord's told you to go there, then you know the Lord's going to provide for you, you know, all your necessities because He's the one that told you to go there. You know, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm you know, starving, you know, after obeying what the Lord has asked me to do, I'm going to say, Lord, hold on, you told me to come here. You know, why am I starving, you know? He should have had his trust in the Lord. Instead, Abraham, like many of us, you know, things got tough, well, I've got to come up with a solution. You know, I've got to come up with a plan contrary to what the Lord has asked me to do. He told me to go to the land of Canaan, but I'm going to go to Egypt because times got tough. And that's going to happen. You know, you, 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 know, you have faith in the Lord. You know, you're walking in His ways. You know, you're on your way to Canaan, you know, figuratively speakingly. You know, and then there's some famine. There's some trial and you're going to be tempted to turn away. Okay? And I want you to take heed to this story. Because when Abraham turns away, when he finds his own solution, he gets into trouble. Okay? He should have just trusted the Lord. He should have just trusted the Lord. Look at verse number 11, please. Verse number 11. It came to pass... When he was come near to enter into Egypt, that he said unto Sarai his wife, Behold now, I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. Therefore it shall come to pass, when the Egyptians shall, shall see thee, uh, that they shall say, This is his wife, and they will kill me, and they will save thee alive. Okay, so you can see the fear of Abraham. He was married to a very beautiful woman, you know, and we'll see later on the Pharaoh wants to take her as his wife, so... She must have been beautiful, you know. But he says here, man, when they see you and they find out that I'm your husband, they're going to kill me and take you for themselves, okay. Now, we can see the faith of Abraham faltering here a little bit, right? Because the Lord already told him, I'll bless th them that bless thee, and I will curse them that curseth thee. God already made Abraham that promise. So if someone was going to come to in, in Egypt, you know, to kill Abraham, if they were going to come and do that, if that was their purpose, God already promised Abraham, I will curse him who goes to curse you, okay? And Ab so you can see that Abraham is, is lacking his faith a little bit now, okay? He's struggling a little bit. You know, he's turned away from the command that God gave him, 
and now you can kind of see his faith going on a downward spiral. You know, he no longer, you know, he's holding to that promise that if someone tries to kill me, well, God's going to sort that out. Okay, he's already promised this to be the case. In fact, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed for me, so I've got to survive this, right? You know, he should have been holding on to that promise, but he became a little weak in his faith there. And then uh, verse number, verse number uh, 14, please. Verse number 14. Oh, sorry, verse, verse number 13, I forgot to mention. And then he says, say, so he's saying to his wife, say, I pray thee that thou art my sister, that it may be well with me for thy sake, and my soul shall live because of thee. What he should have said is my soul will live because of the Lord, because the Lord has promised me, but he thought his wife would be able to get him out of a tough situation. So he tells them, instead of saying that you're my wife, say that you're my sister, okay? That way they don't feel like they have to kill me to take you for as, as um, their wife. You know, if that's, if that's, if that's the case, that's going to happen. Now, keep your finger there and turn to Gen Genesis chapter 20, please. Genesis chapter 20, verse 12. Because you might be thinking, well, Abraham told his wife to lie. Yes and no, okay? Genesis chapter 20, verse 12, just quickly. The Bible says here, because this happened another time later on, and this happens in Genesis 20. It happens again, um, a third time to... Sorry? Jacob. Yeah, yeah, to Jacob. Yeah, happened... You're going to find this story basically three times in the book of Genesis, okay? And this is, this is the first, first time, but in Genesis 20 is the second time, verse 12. It says here, And yet indeed she is my sister. She is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. Okay, just to show you that in the scriptures there, that uh, Sarai is his sister, is his half-sister, his father's daughter, but not his father's daughter. Okay, so she's not a full-blooded sister, but a half-sister. And so if we go back to now Genesis 12, back to Genesis 12, verse 13. So when he asked Sarah to say that about herself, she's not lying. He's not telling her to lie, right? <laughs> but it is deception. Okay, he's purposely trying to deceive the Egyptians. And, you know, you, you know we should not be people that lie, okay? And what you're going to be tempted when you, sometimes you feel like, but I, wanna, I want that person to have a, uh, you know, a, a different view, but I don't want to lie either. What are you going to do? You're going to tell half a truth. Okay, you're going to tell half the truth, and then if they find out that that wasn't quite right, well, well, I didn't lie to you. I told you the truth, but, you know, it's your fault for misunderstanding what I said. <laughs> then, look, that can happen. Sometimes, you know, you, you talk to people, they have an idea, an impression, and, you know, you didn't mean to deceive them. It's like they didn't have all the information at hand, and you probably didn't think about it. But hey, this was a purpose, purpose, uh, purposely done. This was a deception that was purposely done by Abraham. And we ought not to be people like this, okay? Where, you know, instead of telling the truth, you give half the truth for the purpose of deceiving other people, okay? Please don't be that way. Again, you just see the downward spiral of Abraham here, okay? That he's not behaving uh, as a Christian ought to. Now, Genesis 12, verse 14, please. Verse 14, and it came to pass that when, uh, when Abraham was coming to Egypt, the Egyptians beheld the woman, that she was very fair. The princess also, Pharaoh, saw her and com uh, commended her before Pharaoh that the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And he entreated Abram well for her sake, and he had sheep and oxen and, and he asses and manservants and maidservants and she asses and camels. So Pharaoh, in order to win the heart of Sarai, okay, and to treat him well because, you know, they're brothers and sisters, he gives Abraham all this wealth, you know, the, all these, these um, animals and stuff like that. So Abraham becomes quite wealthy through this endeavor, all right? But then verse number 17, and the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues be because of Sarai, Abram's wife. Now, Pharaoh's not done anything wrong as far as what he's concerned, right? He thinks this woman's available, she's free, I want to marry her, and I'm going to even be good to Abraham. I'm going to give him all these possessions, right? But again, the promise of God, okay? And even though Pharaoh did not know that he was cursing Abraham by taking his wife, okay, the Lord knows, and the Lord carried through his promise, and he cursed Pharaoh for cursing Abraham, even though he did it ignorantly, okay? And we see that Pharaoh uh, had all these great plagues upon himself, and this is kind of like a foretelling, a, full, a picture of what would eventually happen 
when all the plagues of the Lord would come upon Israel many, many, time, many, many years into the future when Israel would come out of Egypt. But anyway, it says here in verse number 18, And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this that thou hast done unto me? Why didst thou not tell me that she was thy wife? So at this point, Sarah is probably telling him, the reason you're plagued is cursed and it's because of I'm Abraham's wife. And she, so he finds out about it, right? And verse number 19, Why sayest thou she is my sister? So I might have taken her to, be, uh, to me to wife. Now therefore behold thy sister, take her and go thy way. And Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away and his wife and all that he had. So I just, just end there and just saying, look, God kept to his promise. You know, he, he protected Abraham when um, another man, a powerful man like Pharaoh. I mean, this Pharaoh seems like he's pretty good from what I can see. This Pharaoh here, I'm not talking about the Pharaoh later on, but this Pharaoh in Egypt seems pretty good. You know, he's, he's respectful to the fact that this woman was already married. And, you know, Abraham, I don't believe he had to lie at all because the Lord would have protected him. We see even when Abraham is doing wrong, the Lord keeps his promises, you know. And this just reminds us, guys, that, you know, if we're not faithful to the Lord, one truth that does remain is that the Lord will always be faithful to us, you know, and the Lord will never take away the promises that he's given us, the, the unconditional promises that we, he was gave to Abraham. Hey, we're also going to receive eternal life. We're also going to be partakers of that heavenly kingdom, regardless of how messed up you are, how, how weak you get in the faith, what kind of mistakes you make. At least we have a God that's faithful and his promises never change. Let's leave it there and pray.